Lord, we thank you, Lord. We praise you and come again, Lord, to worship you. Yes, Lord, we come to worship you. We come to sing your praise. We come to love you, Lord. So, Lord, be, let your name be lifted up. Let your name be praised. Oh, we thank you the last Saturday how you visited us. Lord, we ask, we don't chase up with these signs and wonders, but Lord, if you want to come, come in whatever way. So, Lord, we Holy Spirit, we, and we welcome you. We welcome you. Jesus, we enthrone you. Father, we glorify your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
we praise you. Lord, we don't want to just praise you with our lips. Lord, we want to praise you with all of us. With our lives. Not just with our lips. With our actions. Not just with our minds.
presence. And then we lift your name on high tonight. Oh. Lord, your majesty, your wonderful king. Lord, we pray for your will to be done in this place in our lives. Thank God. Tomorrow I'm going to a fellowship of uh, intercessors of the Glen Eagles ministry, which I go every week. And um, I'm gathering at the doctor house. And um, I'm going to start, a, I hope like, I can start a series of sessions. Tomorrow is the first session to lead the intercessors in deeper into the kingdom of God. So a few of us will be there. So pray with us that uh, we can bring them deep into the presence of God. It's not about programs, it's not about methods, it's not about how, but it's about a person of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we want to see. Then uh, as for my flat, after a stressful two weeks, even this morning it was very stressful because the uh, seller agent called me up and there was some misunderstanding between the lawyers and she got shot. And uh, she was very, she was quite emotional, and I uh, handled it. Ah, oh, it's just stressful. But finally, just now at six plus, I heard there's some movement. All right, so um, pray that all the paperwork will be done, and I think I can unofficially get the key next week, July. All right, uh, like Stephen Young prayed, that I can get the key, but I will officially take key end August. All right, so finally it moved. It been stuck for the last five weeks. So it was stressful, but I, I, I thank God. And you know what? It was difficult. This process was quite difficult. I didn't know buying house is so difficult. I thought selling house was difficult. Buying house even more difficult because there were some complications, some family dispute at the seller side. But you know what? It opened up doors for me to minister to the owner, to the owner agent who's a Christian. And now my bank lawyer asked me to minister to her husband so yeah it is difficult but because of all this uh, because of all these things we are in close contact we talk a lot we pray together and finally it opens the doors for us for me and for you to minister to a few people so if the thing have been very smooth then maybe we don't have a chance to minister minister to these needy souls but because of all this complication ah it opened doors for ministry so Ask me frankly, humanly, do I want to walk through this? Humanly, no. But spiritually, I see the door open. So thank God for, for this, okay? So I'll update uh, you all more. So praise God. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked about waiting upon God. And I talked about five reasons why it's good to wait upon God. Tonight, I'm talk something similar along the line. I actually have a, another message prepared, but on Monday the Lord strongly impressed upon my heart to change the message. So I, re, I redo my ma message and I know that it's good if we follow the Holy Spirit. If we obey the Holy Spirit, then it'll be good, right? Well, so it is good to just follow the Lord and I, and I redo my message and uh, it was in a hurry, but I, I thank God. You know, I'm going to talk about being still before God. Stand still being still. Now that is another challenge. In a fast-paced world like ours, it is difficult to stand still. The message is, come on, do something, get going, don't stand still. But look at the Bible. There are many times the Lord called His people to stand still. 
and be still and know that he is God and he will deliver his people. So that is challenge of standing still. We are all geared for actions. It is quite difficult to stand still. Then therefore, we have to learn how to stand still before God when He calls us to stand still. Of course, if God gives you a commission, don't know, I'm still standing still. Go and do it with all your might and all your strength. But when the Lord says, stand still, be still, seek me, oh, then stand still and wait for His hand. Now in the past, as a young boy, I remember playing a game called AEIOU. Have you played a game before? You know, someone will be in front of you with his back towards uh, us and then we try to run to him and the moment he turns around and say, hey, I owe you, we all have to remain still. So, so some, of us, some of us are in very funny position, we are like that, we are like that. No, we are all in very funny position. We have to hold still and he will come around and inspect us to see whether we can hold still or not. If we cannot hold still, then we became the target person. We have to stand in front. And the, the most challenging part was it when we want to sneeze or when our nose are itchy. <laughs> No, that was, that, that, that's the most challenging part. So it's very difficult to stand still. But uh, no, we as, as kids, we played the game before. On the other hand also, as I said, we are living in a very fast-paced world. And we are not like sloths. You know what sloths? Those kind of animals, they will take one day just to walk three, four millimeters. It is so slow. You just sleep all the time. Eat and sleep, eat and sleep. And take one day to walk three or four meters. Okay, so it's a very lazy animal. So if someone say, hey, you look like a sloth, don't think it's a compliment, huh? <laughs> they say that you are lazy. Alright, so, so we, we are geared for actions. Therefore, it's a challenge to stand still. Tonight, I want to talk to us about five reasons why it's good to stand still and be still before God. Why? And the Lord will show us through His scriptures. Alright, number one. Number one. Uh, Exodus chapter 14 verse 13 and 14 Moses told the people Fear not, stand still, firm, confident, undismayed and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today For the Egyptians you have seen today you shall never see again The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace and remain at rest now see, there was a situation. The, the, the Israelites marched out of Egypt. They had victory after the Lord inflicted upon Egypt the ten powerful plagues, and the people went out in triumphant victory. Then they walked around, and then and uh, they were camping at a seashore by the Red Sea. So in front is the Red Sea, behind them is Egypt, and so they camped there. And suddenly they saw the Egyptian army coming, and they panicked. They really panicked. Because the Egyptian army was a, one of the most powerful army in the region in those days. Perhaps the most powerful army in those days. You just imagine eh, the very powerful American army coming after you. And so they were panicky and they were untrained for war. They were not ready for war. And they saw this army coming and the people panicked and they ran to Moses and they blamed him. They say, is it you? Must you bring us here to die? Why don't we die in Egypt? No, it's better to serve the Egyptian than now we're caught in this situation in front of the sea, behind the enemy. Now that's a very bad situation. I've I have watched documentaries. I've read of many uh, war events, and the worst thing for an army to be trapped in is behind the sea, in front is the enemy, or the other way around. You have nowhere to go. That is the worst thing to happen to you. Now, so they panic, they panic and panic. But Moses was confident. And Moses said, don't worry, the Lord will fight for you. Why? Because, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi Hariroth, between Miglo and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Now, as I've shared, it was a very difficult situation. I remember my 2007, most, one of my, my most challenging year. At home, there was a crisis. In church, there was also a crisis. He said, like, when I go home, there's a crisis. When I come to church, there's also a crisis. 
and it was difficult. That year was very difficult. But you see, as I read verse 1 to verse 4, I found that it was the intention of the Lord that this situation arose. It was the hand of God that this situation arose. God intended it to be this way so that He can display His glory. He told Moses, lead the people to that place. That's why Moses was so confident, you know why? Because he has heard the Lord. The people were panicky because they didn't hear God. See what's the difference? When you hear God and didn't hear God, it's a big difference. If you have a situation, and if you have the word of the Lord to back you up, well, there's a big difference. There's a big, big difference. I remember a few weeks ago when I was in Glen Eagles Hospital, I was with Ruth and Caleb. We went into a room, we prayed for a brother, and the Spirit of God just came upon the room. Wow, it was so fantastic. But as I walked out of the room, I felt the Lord telling me, the next patient you pray for, well, the situation, the atmosphere will not be like this. Don't expect too much. And I told Ruth, the situation over there will be different. And it turned out to be this way. When we went into there, the family just said, oh, yeah, you're a prayer camp. But then they were not so open. And we don't feel the spirit moving. And I told Ruth, why I knew is because God told me so. So you see, when you have the word of the Lord, it's very different. When you have the word of the Lord with you, you can face the situation more confidently and differently. Yesterday, I was quite troubled. Yesterday, I was troubled because um, my housing thing, huh? oh, I mean, it's, it's like roller coaster. One day up, one day down, one day up, one day and every day is a different story. You know? I said, what is, what, what, is, what is happening? And then the, the Lord just impressed my heart, stand still. So I, I well, I stood still, I, I worshiped the Lord, and the Lord asked me to read Exodus chapter 14, verse 1 to 4. And as I read, the Lord told me, if I have given the word, it shall be. Well, so I thought, thought to myself, yeah, has the Lord spoken to me about the house in block 24? Yes, so therefore it shall be. So I just continued to worship God, and even this morning a lot of things happened. Finally, just on the evening, the good news came. There's a movement in the sale of the flat. So you see, we need the word of the Lord. And the first point is this, stand still to see your deliverance. Now, of course, many of us are not accustomed to this. We are trained to do, suggest, to think, to think up ideas, to create ideas, to create whatever. We are, think, we are very trained to be action person. And it's quite difficult to just ah, stand still. Ah. Don't do anything. Don't think of anything. Don't suggest anything. Don't plan anything. It is difficult. But if we are to learn to live by the Spirit and stand by God and stand still before God, we have to learn this. When the Lord says, stand still, stand still. Just worship Him. You know, this is the first, this is one of the powerful things I have learned. That is, when He asks me to stand still, I worship Him. If not, you know what happened? I will start thinking. Plan A, Plan B, will this scenario be like this? Will my deliverance be this way? Will, you know, will this and that and that? I was, my mind will go haywire. The best thing is, worship Him. Stand still, not stand still and do, not, do nothing. Stand still before God. Stand still and seek His person and dwell in His presence. That is the best thing for you. If you want deliverance, stand still. Be still and worship Him and seek Him. In 05, I seem to be talking about crisis of church. <laughs> you know, fine. There was a crisis in our former church. Our top leadership wanted to buy a two million dollar house at Thompson Road. Stephen Young and I say, cannot, cannot, cannot. We went there and see. We found that it was not a good deal. The whole deal, uh, I felt, uh, is against us. Uh. The whole deal is that we will not benefit. But the top leadership wanted it very much, and we say no. But after a while, Stephen Young and I, we felt. Yeah, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can say. So, in a very critical moment of the church, I stood still. I shut, shut up my mouth. I, didn't, I don't say anything more. And we just prayed. And in the end, the, leader, the rest of the leaders and the members say, No. And thank God we did not go ahead and pursue that house. Because in 2006, February, our SP resigned. If we have pursued a matter and we, we have so called, so called purchased the house, then Stephen Young and I will be liable. And today he and me will be uh, bankrupt to don't know when. 
I cannot buy a house in Singming anymore. Uh, we are bank declared bankrupt. I thank God that the Lord taught me a very powerful lesson. Stand still and see your deliverance. Stand still and see your deliverance. Have you been trying a lot of things to try to help your situation? Maybe you have thought of this, thought of this, thought of that. No, I, I, I always go through this. You know why? Because I cannot see. I only can hear, feel, and smell, or whatever. Lah. So, many times when, let's say you're traveling MRT, you can take a look at the scenery. I cannot. So, what I do? I daydream. I daydream, or I li li listen to the Bible, or I listen to songs, or I li listen to uh, you, YouTube, or candy, and candy, candle drama. But sometimes, or many times, I daydream. And daydreaming is good, but sometimes to the excess, it's bad. I'll uh, think of this, think of that, thing, 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 and sometimes I get very tired. But I know what I've learned. Stand still and worship the Lord and see your deliverance. If you are in a, in a situation, if you are trying your very, very, very best to do this or do that, do this or do that, and nothing works, perhaps it's time to hearken to the voice of God and stand still and worship Him. And watch your deliverance. Watch out for your deliverance. Moses told the people, stand still and see how God will fight for you. In the end, what happened? The Lord drowned the Egyptian army. And there is archaeological proof of this. The world will not tell you this. The non-Christian world will tell you that this is a fake story. They say the whole book of Exodus is fake. There's nowhere in the Egyptian record that there's such an event. But recently, they have discovered something. They discovered an old 3,000-year-old Egyptian document that um, that documented uh, the disasters in Egypt almost like a template frogs, flies, and uh, low locusts, and so on and so forth. And then, do you know what? They have discovered the remains of Egyptian army chariots at the bottom of Red Sea. But the world will not tell you this. You will go to speak specifically, go and hunt this up. It is there, but they will not tell you this. So the Lord defeated the Egyptian army. Everybody in the army died because of God. God judged the Egyptian army. And the people crossed the Red Sea on dry ground to the, to the uh, promised land, uh, to the beginning of the promised land. So, right, so stand still and watch for the deliverance. The second one, can we turn to Numbers 9 and read the passage? The Lord said to Moses in the walk, wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had came, come out of the land of Egypt. Let the Israelites keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the fourteenth day of this month in the evening, you shall keep it at its appointed time. According to all its statutes and ordinance, you shall keep it. So Moses told the Israelites they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month in the evening in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that commanded Moses, so the Israelites did. And there were certain young and certain men who were defiled by touching the dead body of a man, so they could not keep the Passover on the day. And they came to before Moses and Aaron on that day. Those men said to Moses, we are defiled by touching the dead man a dead body. Why are you prevent uh, why are we prevented from offering the Lord's offering at its appointed time among the Israelites? And Moses said to them, Stand still, and I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, If any man of you or of your posterity shall be uncleaned by reason of touching a dead man a body, for it is far off on a journey, still he shall keep the Passover of to the Lord. On the fourteenth day of the second month, in the evening, they shall keep it, and eat it with unleavened bread with and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any of it a bone of it. According to all the statutes for the Passover, they shall keep it. Thanks. Now you see, there was a situation again, and this is a fresh situation. It was one of the new things that they encountered. They wanted to celebrate the Passover. It was a big feast to celebrate how the Lord uh, brought the people out of Egypt. Passover, the angel Passover, 
all, all the Jewish houses and kill off the firstborn of the Egyptians. And the firstborn of the Jewish family were all spared. So it was called a Passover feast. Now, they wanted to celebrate this. And some people were the so-called ceremonially unclean, got defiled because they touched a dead body. And this was the first time that such a thing happened. So they, they wanted to celebrate the Passover. Their hearts was from the Lord. They wanted to carry on. But they didn't know what to do. So they asked Moses. And Moses said, stand still. While I will inquire of God. Now I'm sure these people would be anxious. What is, what is the answer? Can we? Can we not celebrate? No, I'm sure this kind of thoughts will have gone through their mind. But Moses said very clearly, stand still while I talk with God. Stand still. My point in this second point is stand still to hear God clearly. If you need a word of God, stand still. If you need a word of God for you, be still. Rest in your heart and come and listen to Him and He will speak. Now this is not a philosophical kind of a situation where the people were questioning Moses about some life issues. No, it was a very practical issue. It was a very practical issue because some of them touched a dead body. They don't know what to do. Could they still celebrate the Passover or not? It was a very practical event or um, uh, 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 situation of the Jewish community. And they did the right thing. They asked Moses and Moses went to ask of God. If you want a word of God, you need to stand still. If our heart is unrest, if our heart is full of a lot of things, we can't hear. Because we only hear those worries and concerns and the thoughts of the heart. So therefore, it's necessary to be still and stand still before God. Last Thursday, now I went to pray and I was feeling a bit sleepy and, um, and my mind was filled with a lot of things. And suddenly, I felt this impression to be still before God. And so I said, God, yes, let me be still and hear you. And suddenly, out of nowhere, the Lord told me, Go and connect with these groups of people. Now, when it happened, I'll let you know who they are. I don't want to say who they are first, okay? Um, They're quite influential, okay? And say, go and connect with this group of people. And I say, okay, I will try one overseas contact. I'll try a local contact. And uh, when I searched the handphone, I realized that this contact, um, her, her phone number was 13 years old. So I say, wow, will she keep the, whole, the same phone number for 13 years? So I pray the whole day, God, if you really want me to connect this person, let me miraculously tonight be connected with her. So I call, hey, the phone's still ring. And she pick up the phone, yes. I say, wow, it's you. And she said, yeah, a long time, we have not been talking. And I, I talked to her on my desire, and she says she will try to connect me with this group of people. So now I'm waiting. But I find it very amazing. God just suddenly impressed on my heart what to pray for. And he started the link. The overseas contact, I was also very surprised. I said, do you think you can link me up with this group of people? And she said, all right, I'll do it for you. And so I'm waiting now. But the main thing is, stand still, stand still to hear God. If you want to hear God, stand still. All right, the third point. In Joshua chapter 3, we read the passage. The ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. So now take twelve men from the tribe of Israel, one from each tribe, when the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan coming down from above shall be cut off and they shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out, from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And when those who bore the Ark had come to the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were in the brink of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks through the time of harvest. Then the waters which came down from above stood and rose up in a heap far off at Adam the city that is beside Zarephan, and those flowing down toward the Sea of Arab Bar, the Salt Dead Sea, were wholly cut off, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. 
and while all Israel passed over on dry ground, the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. We know that there was a crossing of the Red Sea. Secondly, there's a crossing of this Jordan River. Then there's another parting of the waters. Remember where? Second Kings. The water divided because Elijah struck the water. It opened up. When Elijah and Elisha walked across over the other side, the water closed back. When Elijah was taken up, Elisha did the same thing. Struck the water and the water opened up again. So there are many river crossing by this supernatural way. Eh? I don't know whether we can do this again now nowadays. If the Lord command, I'm sure we can do this. But anyway, the nation of Israel was crossing into the promised land. And the way that they did it was to follow the instructions of the Lord. The Lord told Joshua, call this priest who were carrying the ark of the Lord to just go to the Jordan River. Now the Jordan River was fast flowing. It was flooding time. The water was, the level is high and it's very fast flowing. My, my friend who went there told me that it's a fast flowing river. And when the feet of the priest who carried the ark of the covenant touched the water, the water that was far, 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 far away began to pop in a heap. The step stood up in a heap. I think it's about 30 kilometers away at, at, at this place where the water stood up in a heap. And somebody calculated, therefore the flow of the river still take about two hours huh, to go completely dry. And finally, the priest went to stand into the middle of the river while the nation crossed over. Now, what point do I make out of this? I think I can see one thing. Stand firm, stand still, in the presence of the Lord, with the presence of the Lord for the deliverance of others. The nation crossed over while the priest holding the Ark of the Covenant stood still in the middle of the river. They stood still with the presence of the Lord and the rest could cross the river. Stand still before God for the deliverance of others. You know, one of the most tiring thing that as a pastor has to do is this we see something not so right with our member we go to them in love talk with them encourage them persuade them to walk in a certain way but the member walk the other way and no matter how, how hard we try the member always walk the other way I thought that is one of the most emotionally, emotional, emotional, drainingly draining part of the ministry. Many times I'm tired out by this because we go with our best intention, we go with our love, and it pains our heart when we see our members go the other way. It is really painful. And over the years, I have learned one thing: stand still for the deliverance of others. There's nothing much I can do. I talk one time, two time, three time, four time, five time. There's nothing much I can do already. So all I need to do, now I learn, is to stand still and pray and be still. I'm learning with someone now. And I'm beginning to see the fruit of it. I just stand still. I just pray. I just stand still. And I see something happening. This is a hard lesson. Now for those of you, for many of us who aspire to be minister, you will have disciples under you soon. Some of us already have many disciples. This is a very difficult lesson to learn. But I pray that we will learn to just stand still, be still before God for the deliverance of others. You know, there was a time I couldn't sleep for a few nights because of someone. And I said, God, what should I do? How could I encourage this member? I know what? One night, the Lord came in a dream. And the Lord said, I will deliver this person. Go to sleep. And I wake up. Okay, okay. And, and I can sleep. I lost sleep. But when the dream comes, the war, praise God, and I slept. And I'll, uh, we just need to stand still before God and see the deliverance of others. Do your best. But if you've done your best, then just stand still. Fourth point. Fourth point, 
And this is from the passage of 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 25 to chapter 10, verse 1. When they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel conversed with Saul on the top of the house. They rose early and about dawn, Samuel called Saul, who was sleeping, on the top of the house, saying, Get up, that I may send you on your way. Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out on the street. And as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servants pass on before us. And he passed on. But you stand still, first that I may cause you to hear the word of God. Then Samuel took the vow of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his heritage Israel? Now see, this was the part of Samuel anointing Saul to be the king of Israel. And Samuel gave very specific instruction to Saul. Send your servants away and stand still. And I'll cause you, I will cause you to hear the word of the Lord. Now what I can derive from this is this. That is when we stand still, we can have revelations of God. When we, can, when we stand still, we can hear the word of the Lord. And then there'll be this anointing, this new anointing for Saul to be king of Israel. Stand still for revelation of God. Stand still, be still for a fresh anointing. You want a fresh anointing in your life? I pray you learn to stand still before God. Yeah, we have anointing for yesterday, but today we need new anointing. Tomorrow, we need new anointing to tomorrow. The day after, we need new anointing for the day after. And every day, if you just learn to stand still before God, I can guarantee you, you will hear God, you have revelation from God, and you have this anointing from the Lord. This is a pattern that the Lord has shown us. This is a pattern the Lord has shown us. And let's look, take a look at Paul's example. Another person who is called Saul. But the, the difference is that they live thousands of years apart. apart eh? Now in Galatians chapter 1 verse 14 to 17. And you have heard how I outstripped many of the men of my own generation among the people of my race in my advancement in study and observance of the laws of Judaism. So extremely enthusiastic and zealous I was for the traditions of my ancestors. But when he who had chosen and set me apart even before I was born and had called me by his grace, his undeserved favor and blessings, saw fit and was pleased to reveal, unveil, disclose his son within me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles the non-Jewish world as the glad tidings gospel immediately I did not confer with the flesh and blood did not consult or console with any frail human being or communicate with anyone nor did I even go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles special messages of Christ before I was but I went away and retired into Arabia and afterward, I came back again to Damascus. Somebody did a calculation. I think Paul went away for a year and a half. No, I, it's very cheap. Right? You, you, you go and do your own calculation. Okay? But he went away for a time in Arabia. He said he did not go and seek anyone. He did not go see the great apostles. He did not see Peter, James and John and so on and so forth. He did not go and consult anyone. First thing that he did was to retire himself in Arabia. Go somewhere and stand still before God. Go somewhere and be still before God to have God reprogram him because he was a Jewish Pharise Pharisee leader. He was a Jewish uh, teacher teaching the Old Testament. And now the Lord has revealed himself to him on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. You can read all this about this. And then if you read on, you saw him going away. All right? And he went away for some time to be still before God and receive fresh revelation and anointing. The anointing that he carried in the past cannot count anymore. And so he went away and to be quiet and be still before God. 
You heard of Stephen Nichols' story, how he sought the Lord for a year, and the anointing came, and that transformed his whole ministry. And nowadays, you will hear him say, you have constant time of seeking God for fresh, Revelation and anointing. My ministry or my prophetic ministry started in 1992 when I lost my job and I was losing my sight. I have nothing much to do and so at home I learned to stand still before God and seek the Lord. And the word of the Lord came, dreams started to come, visions started to come. You know my name calling ministry or calling out name ministry, how it began? Three years ago, Stephen Nicole encouraged me to go watch a video, watch a series of video by this minister. Um, and uh, so I went to YouTube and watched. I spent some time. I remember it was about a week or two. Almost every day I watch. I watch. I, I on YouTube and watch. And this guy was incredible. In the midst of thousands, he could call out, there's a Mrs. Parker here. And then the, the, person, the lady would come crying and things like that. And when I watched that, when I was spending time before God watching that, I said, God, I want that anointing. And it came. And nowadays, every week I spend time fasting before God, seeking Him. I make sure I have time to fast and wait upon Him and there will be fresh revelation. There will be fresh revelation upon revelation. And yesterday when I stood still again, yesterday I was supposed to go swimming but in the end couldn't make it because somebody couldn't make it and then I, I was uh, going through my kettle drama just to relax and then suddenly the Lord said, come, listen to Catherine Kuhlman. I listen. You can go and listen to her videos. Oh, powerful and I have a fresh revelation you know what many of us want to be like David claiming on the promise oh God I want to be what the apple of your eye now many of us would just want to do this because if we are the apple of, the eye, of God's eyes we'll be blessed All right the focus is on ourselves right wow, if I'm the apple of God's eyes then I will be so blessed God will look at me so lovingly and surely he will bless me I mean, this is the thoughts of many of us. But suddenly I have a revelation. If we take the focus of ourselves, if we just focus on God, then it will be, what can I do to be the apple of His eyes? What must I do to be the apple of His eyes? And suddenly I realize I have a fresh revelation. Maybe I'll share this next week. If you want more details of this revelation, come next week. All right, I will share this. And I felt it was a fresh revelation because the Lord told me to stand still. And if you want fresh revelation anointing, learn to stand still and be still before God. There's no shortcut. Learn to stand still and be still before Him. And fresh revelation will come and fresh anointing will come. My last point, 1st King chapter 19. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. 
also anoint Jehu, son of Nishim, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Now you see, Elijah was despondent. He has a great victory in 1 Kings chapter 18. But then Jezreel, the evil queen, came and said, I will kill you. And then Elijah fled. He was despondent, went to a place. The raven fed him, drank all the water. And then the angel appeared, gave him supernatural bread and water. He drank that, ate that twice, and he can walk on for 40 days to the mountain of God. Well, that is some kind of a bread and water. I would like to have a taste of that. 40 days you can walk with that kind of energy. He walked through the mountain of Horeb, the, the mountain of God. And while he was there, God came. But see, God called him to a lonely place. God called him to a lonely place to be alone, to be still before God. And there was a wind. The Lord was not in the wind. There was fire. There was earthquake. But the Lord came in a still small voice and said, What are you doing here? And Elijah complained to him, Oh, no, 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 no. And you see, the Lord didn't answer him. No? The Lord said, Oh, yeah, Elijah, too, so bad. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. Let me sayang you now. Let me just pamper you now. No, the Lord didn't say that. The Lord just said, Go back. I'm now recommissioning you. You are supposed to anoint. Uh, Hazel to be the king of uh, Aram in Damascus. You are uh, supposed to anoint Jehu to be the king of Israel and you anoint Elisha to, to, to succeed you. And Elijah just went. He was revived. He worked for Elijah. He was revived. The Lord did not say, ah, I love you now, come. No. The Lord said, go. I recommission you now. And it seems that the way to revival for Elijah is a recommissioning of a new ministry. Now, but that is another point. But the main point is, be still. Be still before the Lord and have a revival. Be still before the Lord and have a revival. If we are feeling burnt out, despondent, be still. Quieten our hearts and have His Holy Spirit revival. I, I read about the Holy Spirit revival in many places. It all began when one, two, three, four, five percent, ten percent came together and be still before God. It always started like this. The Irish revival started with three men in the broken down primary school. They pray and pray, they worship the Lord, and it broke out. The Welsh revival started because of this guy, Evan Roberts. The Lord touched him, he was hungry for God. The Azusa revival happened because of one blind eye, uh, one, 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 one eye black preacher. He was born with one eye. And he was desperate for God. He sought the Lord and it happened. You want a revival? Oh, learn to be still before God. There is so much value in being still before God. Today I've shared. Be still and see your deliverance. Be still and hear God clearly. Be still and see deliverance for others. Be still for fresh revelation and anointing. Be still for revival. And I know that this kind of message is counter trending the culture. Because the culture is do something, get going, busy yourself, work like crazy, achieve all your goals. That is a message that we have been bombarded with. There's no value in being still. They say time is money. If you stand still, you lose money. It is counter-trending the culture of the society. Therefore, when you go and be still, be realistic. There will be people who will say, what are you doing? Oh, why are you so stupid? Be still and worship God. Come on, do something. God only help those who help themselves. That's a very egoistic statement. If I can help myself, why do I need God? 
God help those who cannot help himself. So I pray today we will learn to stand still before God. Last week, the supernatural visitation of the Lord that came on us on Saturday, it all began when there was a deafening silence. There was an awesome silence that came upon this place. I dare not to move. I dare not move. This silence just came. The silence was so deafening. There was such an awesome silence. And then we saw off have angels worship with us. The chimes move by itself. We hear faint musical instrument play in the background. Now, as I say, we don't chase after all this. Huh? We don't say, God, come, come, come today. We don't say, hey, come, let's see the chimes move again. No. We come and worship God. If he manifests himself in whatever way, then let it be. But there was a silence. Now I'm not saying therefore, huh? therefore we make it a formula, or oh, every time before we start a the service, there must be a five minute silence. Then we're falling back into methodology. But I'm just saying that there's value in being still before the Lord. And maybe perhaps at this time, let's be still for a while. And I'm sure the Lord will come. I know this is not a coincidence. I know this is not a coincidence that suddenly we experience something like that and by Monday the Lord tell me to change the message. I know He want to teach us the value of standing still before God. Let's stand still for a while. The musician, don't, don't, don't do anything. Just stand still for a while.
how we know there is something deep in the silence. Release deliverance. Release your word. Release revelation, anointing, and revival even now. stand still before you. Oh God. Jesus name. Jesus name.